When 19-year-old Lee Porter went missing in 2014, police questioned the last person who saw her, but didn't end up with any answers. It wasn't until Lee's brother Max took matters into his own hands that the truth would finally come out. This is Monsters. Lee Porter was born on December 28, 1994. Her father left the family at some point, and her mother Renee had remarried, and the family lived for a while in Aqua Dulce, California. Eventually, the family relocated to an area in Colorado about an hour and a half west of Pueblo. Her older brother Max was her best friend growing up, and when he went to college in Trinidad, Colorado to study massage therapy, Lee followed. Lee was described as social and outgoing, and it might have seemed like things were going well at first glance. But as Max graduated and moved to California, Lee started to change. She was having problems with her boyfriend at the time and began using drugs. A downward spiral of depression caused Lee to start looking for an escape with heroin. Lee tried to continue her studies alone in Trinidad, but it seemed that whatever demons were haunting her were too much to handle on her own. She decided to make a fresh start by moving to Denver. She had recently reconnected with a friend from high school named Christopher Wade. Christopher became a supportive figure, claiming he would be her accountability partner to help her get off heroin. Christopher seemed like a stand-up guy. He was friendly, outgoing, a former army soldier, and studying criminal justice in college. He convinced Lee that she could get the help she needed there. So Lee packed all of her belongings from her dorm into her car and headed to Westminster, a suburb of Denver. Unfortunately, Lee would never be seen again. Christopher Wade grew up in a devoutly religious family in Cotopaxi, Colorado, the same small town Lee lived in west of Pueblo. As he grew up, he turned away from his family's religion and became more interested in paganism, and it was through those beliefs that he began studying tarot cards. After graduating from high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Army, but his military career was short-lived. After he was discharged, he moved to the Denver area and began studying criminal justice. In early June of 2014, Max began calling around, asking if anyone had seen his sister. He usually spoke to her every day, and he was concerned that he hadn't heard from her in a few days. When Max called their mother and found out that she also hadn't heard from Lee, they both started to panic. Renee paid for Lee's cell phone, so she had access to her call records. They found a number that she had been in contact with a lot, and it turned out to belong to Christopher Wade. They also learned that on June 2nd, Lee had stayed at the Castle Inn in Castle Rock, about 30 minutes south of Denver. It turned out that she had spent the night with her boyfriend, Jesse, and the couple were saying their goodbyes due to his plans to move out of state. Max ended up breaking the news to Renee that Jesse was a tattoo artist that was 20 years older than Lee, and he was the one who had gotten her hooked on heroin. Lee had also confided in Max that Jesse had a short temper and that she was afraid of him. Police questioned Jesse, but couldn't find any evidence that he was involved in Lee's disappearance. Also, the last time Lee's family had heard from her was after she had left the hotel, so it was unlikely that that's where she had disappeared from. Renee and Max then contacted Christopher, and he explained that Lee had arrived on June 3rd, but had gotten a text message at about 11 p.m. that night and left. With that information, Lee's family reported her missing to the Westminster Police Department. Authorities interviewed Christopher, and he told them the same thing he'd told Lee's family. Well, kind of. He added that they had gone to Boston Market to eat that day and went back to his apartment where they played video games. Then she got a text message at about 11 p.m., after which she left in a white pickup truck. That was something he hadn't told Renee when she asked him what had happened. His claim that she left in someone else's vehicle made sense, though, because her vehicle, still packed full of her belongings, was found in the parking lot of Christopher's apartment. The vehicle was processed for evidence, but nothing notable was found. 
A surveillance video from the local Boston market showed the two getting something to eat, just as Christopher described, and nothing about Lee's behavior in the video indicated anything might have been wrong. Christopher welcomed investigators into his apartment and let them look around, but they didn't find anything incriminating right away. From there, Christopher was on the front lines of the efforts to find Lee. He posted information online, begging Lee to call someone to let them know she was okay. Despite having no evidence that Christopher was involved in Lee's disappearance, Renee and Max thought something was off about him. His involvement in finding her seemed more self-serving than anything. When interviewed, he would talk about how her disappearance affected him and would boast about how much of a loyal friend he was. Tried texting her, tried calling her, left her some messages on Facebook, and haven't heard anything back from her. I don't really have very many friends. Friends I do have, I'm very loyal to, so even losing one is a heavy blow for me. The problem with Christopher's statements was that he and Lee weren't that close. They had gone to high school together, but they weren't really close friends, and since reconnecting, had only talked online. The red flags were shooting up for Renee and Max. Another red flag for Max was the stories he had heard about Christopher back when they were both in high school. There were rumors that Christopher had a journal where he wrote about his plans to kidnap women and keep them as sex slaves. There was a record of multiple students having reported Christopher to the school for writing about murder and sexual assault. On top of that, Christopher's military record showed that he had been discharged from the army after he told a psychiatrist that he had tried to kidnap, sexually assault, and murder a teenage girl while he was still in high school. The psych report says that Christopher claimed that he had broken into a home in the middle of the night with the intention of carrying out the abduction, but someone ended up being awake and he ran off before anyone saw him. On June 10th, investigators went back to Christopher's apartment to do a more thorough search. The place was filthy, with old food and garbage lying everywhere. Amongst the garbage, they found a knife that had spots on it from being cleaned with bleach. Christopher claimed that he had accidentally cut himself with the knife, so he cleaned it. Investigators also found a receipt for the purchase of bleach and rubber gloves dated June 4th, the day after Lee went missing. Investigators also noticed that there were no sheets on the mattress. When they asked him where the sheets were, he suddenly remembered that Lee had gotten a nosebleed while she was there, and so he took the sheets off and put them in the laundry basket. But when detectives asked to see the sheets, he changed his story and said that Lee had taken them with her when she left. Yeah, that sounds super reasonable. Because of the inconsistencies in his story, investigators took him to the station for questioning, where Christopher denied any involvement in Lee's disappearance. Being a criminal justice student, he was well aware of what the interrogation entailed, and it wasn't long before he lawyered up. Due to the lack of evidence, authorities had to let him go. Max knew that Christopher had done something to his sister, and he wasn't about to let Christopher off the hook. It turned out that Christopher was into some New Age religious techniques and was known to do tarot card readings. Max asked him if he would do a tarot card reading for him to get some answers about what had happened to Lee, and Christopher agreed. On June 12th, Christopher, Max, and a few of Max's friends met at a gazebo in a park, and Christopher did a reading. He claimed that the cards showed him that Lee was going to turn up eventually, and that everything would be okay. This isn't the best reading, the best uh, omen for a reading I've done, but it is fairly positive. I don't see any indication of anything who would want any, anything or anyone who would want to harm her or physically impede her in any way but i do see that when she's coming out of this she'll be the better for it i don't know about uh, different but i think that she will be a changed woman when she comes out of it i don't is the only card that has any Bad, uh, I guess you could say bad omen would be the Two of Swords. The Five of Wands is a neutral omen, but it indicates paranoia. So she might be feeling really scared right now, but the Three of Pentacles and the Lovers are both very positive, as is the, as is the Six of Pentacles. So I would say there's, there's every chance she'll 
The, when she's found, it'll be safe and sound. What Christopher didn't know was that Max was recording the meeting with his phone. He had one goal in mind, to get the truth out of Christopher. He gradually pushed Chris until he broke and agreed to tell them the truth. What I say right now, it's going to be very hard, but until I come forward with them to it, it'll be within the week, I swear to you. But I'm going to ask, I'm going to have to ask you to keep it to yourselves until then. You tell me right now what happened to my sister. You know what happened to my sister. Yes. You know if she's alive or if she's dead. You know. I do. Unlike in my original story, afterwards, she wasn't tired and didn't ask to pass out. She tried to use that to manipulate. She didn't. She wasn't yelling, but she was very venomous. <laughs> uh, and she grabbed the knife that I keep by my <laughs> by my bed. And when we go back, I can show it to you. What she, happened with the knife? She grabbed it and pulled it out and tried to attack me. Saying that she would stop attacking me if I agreed to buy drugs for her. She, I don't know, but she was, there was desperation in her eyes. She wouldn't I, do that, dude. She wouldn't do well, that, Chris. Stop lying. She wouldn't do that. I'm not lying. She wouldn't do that. Keep going. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just over I am not lying. Okay. She thrust at me twice. I dodged the first one, then I grabbed her hand on the second. And when she thrust again, I turned, grabbed her then stepped forward and twisted her around so that her body was in between me and the knife. And then I placed my hand at her throat. I didn't start squeezing until after she kept going. I said, I can, we can end this right now. There will be nothing. I won't say anything to anyone. Just please drop the knife. And I'll let, and I'll let you go. You can get dressed. You can leave and go wherever. And she said that she would stop when I... Uh, when either she was dead or if I agreed to buy her drugs. I told her I did not want that. I told her straight up to please stop and get dressed and go. But she used both of her arms to push against me with the knife, trying to cut my arm to get me to let go so she could keep attacking. So I started squeezing on her throat. Honestly, she, um, I thought that her muscles would relax when she went unconscious and that I could gradually move the knife away and let her go and let her regain consciousness. But that didn't happen. I'm, I've been running through my head trying to figure out why. She kept on fighting and fighting. I kept on telling her, to drop the knife and I would stop. Drop the knife and I'll stop. You can, and I will leave the room. I'll be waiting out in the patio. You can get dressed, you can go. I won't, I, I'll stop talking to you completely. But she kept shaking her head, no. Adrenaline was rushing through. I didn't, I didn't see her stop shaking her head, but she was still, she was still pushing against my hand. So, but, then it was like a rubber band snapped and she just, it just went completely lax. And I, it took me, it took me completely by surprise and I ended up cutting her. It was, it wasn't very deep. It was about an inch or inch and a half cut along her sternum. That took me completely by surprise and I dropped her. I, she landed on the floor. I turned her over to check and make sure she was still alive. I didn't check with on her throat because I had just been grabbing there, so I didn't I didn't think I could get a clear reading off of that. So I checked her wrists and when that didn't when I didn't find anything there, I checked under her arms and then the inside of her legs as well. According to Christopher, once they returned from Boston Market, Lee asked him for money and when he refused, she grabbed a knife and tried to stab him. He claimed that he choked her in the process of fighting her off, and when she went limp, he noticed that she had gotten stabbed in the chest. 
He went on to explain that he covered everything up, buying the bleach to clean up the knife in the apartment. He then put Lee's body into a duffel bag and threw it in the dumpster at his apartment complex. Christopher then callously claimed that he would be turning himself into the police within the week, but Max wasn't having any of it. I know you won't believe me, but I will be turning myself into the police. I will tell them... No, you're going to jail right now. You're going to prison right now. Where do you think you're going, man? You think I'm just going to let you walk away and drive away? You killed my what? goddamn sister. You can't. You can't. Come on, let's get my phone, get out of there. All this recorded, call the fucking cops. They're already on their way. Max jumped over the table and attacked Chris before making him call 911 and confess to the operator. 911? Uh, yes, I'd like to confess to him, I guess. Okay, what happened? The case being handled by detectives, uh, the case being handled by detectives Lopez and, and Lynch. By Detective Lopez and Detective Lynch? Yes. Where are you at? Um, I'm at the park here in Westminster. It's on Cherry Street. I don't know the crossroads, but I, uh, uh, um, You're near the pond? Yep. What is your name? Christopher Wade. It turned out, unbeknownst to Max, the police were also surveilling Christopher at the time, so they were already nearby when Christopher had confessed. He was quickly arrested. Now, the truth that Christopher was indeed involved in Lee's disappearance and ultimately her death was out, but Chris was claiming it was self-defense. He wanted people to believe that deadly force was the only option against the 90-pound young woman who was supposedly attacking him, an ex-military man who had trained in jiu-jitsu. Of course, that's all assuming he was telling the truth when he claimed that Lee had attacked him, which we all know is complete and utter bullshit. It's believed that Christopher Wade intentionally lured Lee to his apartment so he could carry out his fantasy of committing murder. In his military psych record, the psychiatrist detailed Chris explaining that he dreamed about killing someone and it's part of the reason he was discharged. It's also believed that the reason he was going to school for criminal justice was to learn techniques to help him get away with murder. Now, despite a full confession, it's still difficult to get a murder conviction without a body, so investigators went to the landfill and spent weeks digging through literally tons of debris in an effort to find Lee's remains. Despite finding her clothing, wallet, ID, and her cell phone, Lee's body was nowhere to be found. Because of that, the prosecutor felt it would be best to offer Chris a plea deal. Of course, nobody believed Christopher's claims of self-defense, but there was no way to disprove that without the body. They offered him second-degree murder in exchange for the location of Lee's body. Christopher accepted the deal, and when the paperwork was signed and they asked him what he did with her body, he told them the same story. He put it in a duffel bag and threw it into the dumpster at the apartment complex. The prosecutor honored the deal despite that. Christopher Wade was sentenced to 48 years in prison, but that sentence wasn't just for second-degree murder. That sentence also includes a charge of sexual exploitation of a child because they found child pornography on his computer during their search of his apartment. Because that's the kind of monster Christopher Wade is. He fantasized about harming other people for his own gratification, whether that was victimizing children or murdering a young woman and destroying her family's lives. All Christopher Wade cared about was Christopher Wade. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.